بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Dear brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته One of our mothers the mothers of the believers one of the Prophet's wives sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam was a woman who underwent a lot of tribulations, calamities, trouble and problems in her life. And she was the daughter of the leader of Quraysh at his time. Her name was Ramla, but she's most famous among the Muslims with her nickname, which is Um Habiba. She's Ramla bint Abi Sufyan ibn Sakhr ibn Harb. Her mother is Safiya bint Abi Al-As ibn Umayya. She was born 17 years before the first revelation came to the Prophet ﷺ. This means that when the Prophet migrated to Medina, she was 30 years of age. In the beginning, she accepted Islam. And she got married to Ubaidillah ibn Jahsh. Ibn Rabab, they both accepted Islam and she was pregnant when they decided to flee Mecca and migrate to Abyssinia. There, she gave birth to her daughter Habiba, which she is nicknamed by. Now, she was the daughter of Abu Sufyan. And whenever the name is spoken, people acknowledge him as the head of Quraysh, especially after the Battle of Badr, where all the dignitaries and the top idol worshippers who led the aggression against Islam were killed. So when Abu Jahl, Utbah, Shayba, the sons of Rabi'ah, Umayyah ibn Khalaf, Ubay ibn Khalaf, Uqba ibn Abi Ma'iq, all these people were killed in the Battle of Badr. The name of Abu Sufyan resonated all over the place. And he was the one who led the army on the battle of Uhud. And he was the one to lead all other battles and aggressions against Islam, the Muslims. So to imagine that his own flesh and blood, his own beloved daughter accepts Islam when he is one of the greatest enemies of it, it shows how strong her Iman was. She fled Mecca and her father's oppression to go to a new land, to go to people that don't speak her language, don't share her traditions and customs while pregnant in a sea journey that was full of danger just to be able to worship Allah Azza wa Jal alone. She disobeyed her father despite knowing that it is mandatory to obey the father. And this is the fork of the road a lot of the Muslims face when they are given the choice between obeying their parents or obeying Allah the Almighty. 
any Muslim who submitted his will to Allah knows that there is no obedience to any of the creation in disobeying Allah the Almighty. Allah comes first without a second. You must obey Allah Azza wa Jal no matter what the consequences are. So she migrated. When they settled in Abyssinia, she tells us that she saw a vision and she saw her own husband, Ubaidullah, in a very bad situation and status. He looked awful. So she was scared. And when she woke up, she said to herself, by Allah, he's not like he used to be. But what can go wrong? They both were Muslims and they both migrated for the sake of Allah. So she saw him soon afterwards, after she woke up. And he started the conversation by saying, Umm Habiba, I contemplated upon, upon the religion. I did not see any religion better than Christianity. And you, as you know, I was a Christian before. Then I accepted Islam. And now I'm telling you that I have gone back to Christianity. And as you know that the Abyssinians were all Christians. So this may raise the flag on the ruling of migrating to a Christian country or a non-Muslim country and the impact that it would have on those who have weak Iman. As we see in the second generation of Muslim families that travel and migrate and settle in such non-Muslim countries. So she told her husband of the dream she saw and how awful and bad he was in it, which would be a sign to anyone with intellect that what you're doing is wrong. But he did not pay her any attention and he kept on drinking wine, getting wasted for the rest of his, of his life until he died in Abyssinia as a kafir and an apostate. Now, she left to Abyssinia, pregnant, defying her father's orders, defying her own people, fled with her religion, trying to worship Allah Azza wa Jal. And now she's stranded in a country that she does not speak the language of, a foreign country. Her father opposes her. Her husband has become an apostate and a Christian, and she is on her own. Yet she was like a mountain that the winds cannot shake. She remained steadfast on Islam. And she didn't know what Allah had in store for her. But Allah definitely wanted to her the best of this dunya and the best of the akhirah as well. In Medina, hundreds of, and thousands of miles away, the Prophet ﷺ was not in the dark of what was happening to his companions wherever they were. He was the supreme leader and he knew what was happening to his companions and he was following their news and affairs and keeping in touch with them. And this shows you that the Prophet ﷺ was not any normal person or any normal leader. He was the perfect man, the perfect human, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Though he was illiterate, he could not read and write. But if you study his life story and biography, you will be shocked of such perfection. 
in terms of human nature. The Prophet والسلام, while in Mecca, knew every country around him and who was the leader in such countries and how he treated the people and those who came as visitors. And this is why when the oppression reached the max, the Prophet told the companions to migrate to Abyssinia. Why not to Egypt? Why not to the east part of Arabia? Because the Prophet knew والسلام, and he told them that, that in Abyssinia, there is a just ruler, a just king. People would not be wronged in his presence. He's fair and just. So the Prophet والسلام, knew what was going on. He is a responsible official checking on his citizens. So when he was told that Um Habiba, a woman of honor and reputation, the daughter of Abu Sufyan, the head of Quraysh, when he heard about the things that she had faced there and how she was patient, steadfast, and firm on her beliefs, the prophets, alayhi salatu wasalam, help came to her as soon as it was possible. Um Habiba says, may Allah be pleased with her, I saw another vision. And I saw in the vision someone calling me, Ya Umm al Mu'mineen, O mother of the believers. So I woke up frightened and I interpreted it that the Prophet will marry me, alayhi salatu wasalam. Though it was quite far-fetched due to the distance and lack of communication. And not before long, after her idda was over, a messenger from the Abyssinian leader, and Najashi, came to her. She was the concubine of a Najashi who was in charge of his clothes and his perfume. And she said to her, my master had sent me to tell you that the Prophet ﷺ had, send, had sent to him to propose for you in marriage. So an Najashi says, what do you say? And she said, of course, I accept that. May Allah give you the glad tidings as well. So the Najashi, the king said, then appoint someone to be your guardian. And she appointed Khalid ibn Sa'id ibn al-As to be her guardian. The stories say that she was among the Prophet's wives, most to receive dowry, where an Najashi gave her 400 dinars and lots of perfumes and lots of jewelry and lots of clothes. And this was from an Najashi himself. But it was considered to be the dowry of the Prophet ﷺ. And no other woman the Prophet had married ﷺ was over so long distance. She got married and came back to Medina on the seventh year of Hijrah, the year of Khaybar, which means that she remained with the Prophet as his wife ﷺ for four years only. When she came to Medina, she was one of the Prophet's honored wives. There is a report or a story that circulates around where her father Abu Sufyan came to visit the Prophet and tried to extend the truce period. And then he visited his daughter's house and when he wanted to sit on the mattress, she folded it. And he was shocked. Do you want me to sit on the ground? I don't know, my daughter, whether you think that the mattress does not fit me because it's dirty, or you think that I'm not worthy of sitting on such a mattress. And she said that you are a disbeliever. And this is the mattress of the Prophet ﷺ and you must not make it impure by sitting on it. 
Now, this story is quite famous, but it is not authentic. And therefore, we just mentioned it to remind the people to be aware of stories that are not that authentic, especially when it comes with dealing with non-Muslims, which is part of the rulings of Islam. So I don't want a son or a daughter to treat his father in a similar way, depending on such a story which is not authentic in the first place. Mother Um Habiba, may Allah be pleased with her, had many stories. But one of them that impacted the life of the Prophet ﷺ and also gave us a ruling in Islam was when she proposed to the Prophet ﷺ to marry her sister, Azza, the daughter of Abi Sufyan. And this was, whoa, we know that she is a jealous woman, but how can she do that? So the Prophet ﷺ looked at her and said, to her, would you like me to marry her? And she said, O Prophet of Allah, it's not that I don't love you or I would like you to go somewhere else, but I heard that you were going to marry someone else. So the best one in my view to share with me my love would be my sister rather than a stranger. So the Prophet ﷺ said to her, this is not lawful for me. Meaning that a man cannot combine between two sisters in the same marriage. This is totally prohibited. And the marriage is void. So she said to him, in this case, people are circulating among themselves that you are going to marry Durra, the daughter of Abu Salama. And he asked to inquire, Durra, the daughter of Umm Salama, who's my wife? And she said, yes. And he again said, by Allah, if she wasn't my stepdaughter, she would still not be halal for me. Because Abu Salama and myself are brothers. Thuwaybah, the slave woman suckled us when we were infants. So she is my niece because her father is my brother. Do not offer me your daughters or your sisters. So that was the end of it. Now, Um Habiba was a woman who followed the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ to the letter. And she conveyed that to us and taught the whole ummah such things. When her father died, it is normal for people to mourn their loved ones. And her father, by the way, Abu Sufyan, accepted Islam on the eighth year of Hijrah, the year of the conquest of Mecca. And he became a good companion of the Prophet ﷺ and fought battles in the cause of Allah. So when he died, his daughter mourned him. Only to order on the third day of his death some perfume which she applied on her sideburns and on, on her hands and arms. And she explained to those who were around her so that they could convey this knowledge to the Muslims. She said, by Allah, I don't have any interest in getting perfumed. But had I not heard the Prophet ﷺ say, it is not permissible for a woman who believes in Allah in the day of judgment to mourn over a dead person over three days, except if he were her husband, then she must mourn for four months and ten days. So being my father, I had only three days to mourn him according to the hadith and instruction of the Prophet ﷺ, and hence this is why I asked for the perfume to be applied. And if you look all around you, you will find the Muslims 
always abiding by the emphatic sunnah prayers. And we all know that 12 rak'ahs in the day and the night would build you a house in Jannah. This hadith came to us through who? It came to us through Umm Habiba, may Allah be pleased with her, where the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever prays during the day and the night, 12 rak'ahs, Allah will build him a house in paradise. Four before Dhuhr, two after it, and two after Maghrib, and two after Isha, and two before Fajr. So she was the one who conveyed this hadith to us. May Allah be pleased with her. And even though she was in good relationships with the other co-wives, the other mothers of the believers, she was in good relationships with them. However, when it was time for her to leave this world, she sent to Aisha, to Umm Salama, to all the other wives of the Prophet ﷺ, telling them, Aisha says, Umm Habiba called me while she was on her deathbed. So I came and she said to me, you know, Aisha, as co-wives, there must have been something between us and anything that was done, I pray to Allah that he forgives me and forgives you whatever we had done. So she is telling Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, that she is setting her free from any liability on the day of judgment as she has forgiven her anything wrong that she had done or said to her. Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, reciprocated on the spot and she said, may Allah forgive you all of this and may Allah Azza wa Jal overlook all of your sins. I have made you free from any wrongdoing that came to me through you. And she said, may Allah Azza wa Jal please you as you have made me happy and pleased. And she sent to uh, all the mothers of the, the believers the same thing. Um Habiba, may Allah be pleased with her, died in Medina in the year 44. And she was 80, she was 68 years of age and she died in the reign of her uh, uh, brother Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, the caliph at that era. May Allah Azza wa be pleased with her, our mother, our mother and the wife of the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam. Hada wallahu a'lam wa nisbatu al-ilmi ilayhi aslam wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.